and when I say we're battling for healthcare, we're battling for mental health care. Still today, four out of five mentally ill people go untreated. And this is startling because, you know, we think that we talk so much about it. There's been so much press about it. But when we start looking at the statistics, we realize that we are a far cry away from where we should be. Today, I'm speaking with Daman Singh. I'm very excited. She has a new book. It's called Asylum. And that in itself made me think when, you know, the title itself caught my eye. Daman is an Indian writer and she's the daughter of former Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh. And her new book takes us through the history of the mental health care and the asylums in India since the earlier 20th century. A lot of people will ask, why do we need to understand that? Because I also feel that if you don't understand history and you don't understand the legal structure and what we're going to talk about today, it doesn't help us understand why we are here and how we can move forward. But Daman, a very, very warm welcome. We're excited to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much for including me. Oh, so this topic, I know it's a burning topic because it's something that, you know, you look at all the news sites, everybody is talking about mental health care, especially with COVID. You know, we know that a lot of people are suffering and yet people still do not get treatment. And when I read your book, I mean, I look at the conditions and I sometimes look at them and you're talking from the earlier 20th century. But sometimes it feels like not much has changed in terms of the way the conditions are, some of the treatments still are quite bizarre. But what drew you to this topic and why did you want to write about it? Well, it is really quite by accident that I got into this subject. Uh, I was attending a series of seminars on uh, mental health uh, purely as a participant. I wasn't really contributing. But when I uh, heard uh, the other speakers, uh, they were from all kinds of professions. There were psychiatrists, psychologists, activists, social workers, writers. Um, I just uh, felt I needed to know more. And that's when I started reading up uh, about mental health care in India. And uh, you know, I soon came to the point where I felt it's not enough to read. I also want to write. And that's <laughs> No, and it's good because, as you said in your book, there's not much written about this. So, I mean, it's not like we had a lot of sources to go back to, to really understand the history. So tell us, why is it important for us to understand the history? Well, you know, my sister's a historian, so she could give <laughs> several lectures on the subject. But uh, I'm only looking at history in, you know, in this particular field that is mental health care. Um, why is history important? I think it is important because we haven't got it right so far. We haven't done enough. And we are, I think, at a stage where we must and we can do much more. But what we do, how we think about the future does depend a lot on what we have done in the past. Uh, we have tried so many things. Uh, some have worked, some have not worked. And it's important to understand the background before we talk about the future that lies ahead. So I know your book, it's hard to cover everything, but what would you think like for normal people, what are the two, three things that we should all know that have been instrumental in shaping or changing mental health care in India? Well, if we look at the last 100 years or so, um, I think one big thing that we need to, well, it's useful for us to know is that we were a late start, we had a late start. So while uh, other, uh, you know, better, uh, more advanced countries had begun to reform mental health care, at least in the middle of the 19th century, we made a start only in the beginning of the 20th century. So we are, you know, since then we've been trying to catch up and it has been a very, very slow process. So the idea is now to uh, speed up you know, speed up fast. So that's one thing. The second thing is that uh, one of the key decisions that was taken uh, by uh, early uh, colonial rulers uh, was that <clears throat> we need specialists. We need uh, doctors, personnel who are trained to deal with mental health, mental illness, and who have the experience to do so. So that is another thing that uh, continues to uh, be, uh, you know, on the top of our agenda. I guess the next thing is that we need the right 
laws and we need the right policy. And uh, I think we have just about reached the stage where we have the right laws, we have the right policies, and it's, it's up to us to take these forward. So I think that implies also our right mindset, because Absolutely. right now have we reached the mindset? And I think that's slowly happening with us understanding a little bit more, I think as a society about mental illnesses. But I wanna talk about something because I felt, or at least when I read your book, the name change. I mean, when we used to call them lunatic asylums to mental hospitals, just the significance of this name change was also very, very important. And also a lot of changes, like especially as when we watch the movies, the restraint system a lot has changed but let's talk specifically about what are those big changes also that happened well you mentioned the word the term lunatic asylum this used to uh, be the common term uh, uh, the word lunatic was considered perfectly acceptable the word asylum was considered perfectly acceptable these words are not acceptable today so um, so lunatic has been sort of shunted out of our vocabulary and now we talk about mental disorder or uh, mental illness and asylum asylum uh, actually means a place of refuge a place of sanctuary uh, but what uh, we are now looking at is hospitals hospitals where patients are treated just like you know uh, they're treated for any sort of illness. Hospitals where they are treated and uh, where a cure is in many cases possible. So that's that's one big thing. Uh, did you mention any other? Uh, the restraint thing? system. The restraint yeah. system, yes. Yeah, people being isolated, restrained, quite horrendous conditions. Yeah, so, I mean, not all mental disorders are alike, but there are some disorders which in which a, a, a person seems to be unmanageable. And so in the old days, what did you do with such a person? If he was at home, you would probably just confine him to a room, lock him up. Uh, in, in the early asylums, that is also what was done when people were unmanageable. They simply locked them up or they, you know, they, they put restraints on them, you know, some, something similar to handcuffs, something similar to chains, the kind of things that were used in prisons were borrowed in order to so-called uh, manage patients. Uh, yeah, when you talk about jails, I'm also reminded in your book, first people were sent to jail if there was no space in the asylum. Yes, exactly. I mean, what a shocking thing to do. Uh, I don't know how that, uh, that continued to exist, not just in British times, but even after independence. You know, hundreds of people who had committed no crime or were not suspected of committing any crime, their only fault was that they had seemed to have a mental problem and they had to go to jail for that. Yeah, no, that was, it was something that, it was some new learning for me. But the, I think that key term is hospital. And I think that is such a huge impact on the way that we actually, even as a society, will start to perceive the mental health care, especially when we start to think about it in these terms. Another big change, at least I felt, was that when psychological medicine became part of the medical curriculum in India, when did that happen? And tell us about that, because still people feel that we don't have enough mental health care workers, mental health care professionals, given the population that we have. That's absolutely true. Uh, you know, uh, in British days, uh, the people who were available, psychiatrists, etc., they were all uh, they were mostly trained abroad, or you had Indian doctors who had an Indian medical degree but went abroad for specialization. So you know, at the time of independence, we had maybe 40, 50 individuals in the whole country who had some sort of specialization, and to take that up to you know what we need today was a monumental task. And um, as you know, education is a, a state subject. So different states responded to this need differently. Um, but despite all efforts, we are still hugely short of personnel, hugely. Yeah. 
Yeah. And two acts or two laws, at least as I understood after reading your book, was the Mental Health Care Act of 1987 and 2017. These were the ones that actually brought the most significant change. Can you tell us a bit about why these are so important and what changes they brought? Well, the 1987 Act, uh, the, uh, the ideas behind that act were actually put forward in 1950. So it was that many years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> so in that sense, it wasn't a truly modern law. You know, it was still somewhat based in the thinking that existed in 1950. But uh, having said that, I think it did two important things. One is that it said that if someone needs short term treatment, uh, say up to two or three months, you can go straight to the hospital and seek admission, the mental hospital. Um, before that, this was not possible. You had to go to a magistrate to get a, a court order to seek admission. And just that whole process of going to the court and you know getting caught up in all these legal hassles, uh, it was a huge uh, discouragement uh, to people who, who were seeking uh, help. Uh, the other, I think, big thing that this 1987 law did is that it tried to bring in a system through which uh, institutions, whether they were mental health institutions, uh, hospitals, nursing homes, private uh, hospitals, private nursing homes, all these would be somewhat regulated. Um, that actually didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, the effort was there, the attempt was there. Now, coming to the 2017 Act, this is a completely new Act. This is, and this is very, very new because this is uh, only like four years, right? This is very radical. This really turned the old Act on its head. And the thinking behind the new Act is that uh, a patient, anybody, uh, suffering from a mental illness um, has rights and these rights have to be upheld. So this person has a right to, to get proper treatment. This person has a right to know what exactly his problem is, what exactly uh, treatment is being recommended and how, and he can agree or disagree to this, this, this treatment. Now, there would be times, perhaps, uh, when uh, a person might not be in a position to take this decision for himself. And in such cases, there is a process of how to appoint a representative who will speak for this person. Uh, so also, you know, um, it was also very clearly laid down that a person has a right to be treated in any of these facilities, in any mental health institution with dignity, with respect, you know, his basic needs of food, water, shelter uh, must be respected. So this was a really a huge step forward. Let's talk about that, the human rights, because I actually that was something I also learned, because even at the global stage, the Convention of Rights of People with Disabilities only happened at 2006. So this is not like we would have imagined that something would have happened at the global stage much sooner. But this is something also recently that has happened also worldwide. That's right. Um, I think the whole uh, the human rights movement at the UN level, at the sort of multi-government level, uh, really started in 19, maybe 48. And so it started with a very broad charter about human rights. You know, it listed maybe, I don't know, 20, 20 clauses or 20 principles. And then over the years, they would pick up one of those principles and expand on it. So it's not as though, you know, nothing happened in the, you know, the next 50 years. They, they went deeper and deeper and deeper. So at each level, uh, a little more uh, progress was made. But I think you're absolutely right. It's only in 2006 that a very detailed uh, document was agreed upon, leaving no room for doubt. 
you know, earlier there were some, you know, they were, you could interpret things a little differently. Like even if India signed on, there were ways to sort of not do 100% of what was required. So now it is very clear. There are no doubts about what should be done. No, it's good because I think that is also instrumental. But one of the things at least I, I learned was from 1947 to 1986, number of beds have doubled and facilities have gone from 30 to 45. But when you look at that number, it's very, very small, you think, compared to the size of India. So can we talk about this? And what is the number that we would actually need for the population? And what are the number of beds that we need for our population? Um. Well, you know, there was a time when all treatment for mental disorders was concentrated in a mental hospital, you know, but by the time you reach the number of 45, as you mentioned in the 80s, uh, it was realized that much of the treatment actually can and should take place in other places. So for instance, uh, general hospitals, uh, whether they are government hospitals or private hospitals, just as they have a department of whatever, ortho, orthopedics. So they can also have a department of psychiatry. So this was the push uh, around maybe the mid 70s onward that let us not sort of pin all our hopes on the mental hospital, let other hospitals open departments of psych uh, psychiatry, departments of clinical psychology. And that has been a, a very, very big achievement. Because uh, for, say, me uh, to go to, if I have a mental problem, I think the, the nearest mental hospital is pretty far away from where I live. Yeah. But, but there is, you know, down the road, there is a hospital. It has a department of psychiatry. So access becomes so much easier, you know, when you open up, when you, you spread the departments of psychiatry to general hospitals. So tell, tell us this, because I think we often get confused as lay people. What's the difference between clinical psychology and psychiatry? Are they the same? And when do we need to go to seek help from whom? Gosh, that's a really I know, question. big question, <laughs> very loaded question, because it's very confusing, at least to the lay person yeah. still. Well, um, psychiatry is a branch of medicine. You know, I mean, you have what? If you can think of all sorts of branch, like cardiology is a branch, so psychiatry is a branch. So a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. He has done an MBBS. That MBBS will include uh, some amount of lectures or teaching about psychiatry, but he will have uh, done his post-graduation in psychiatry. He will have specialized after his MBBS. So uh, that's the psychiatrist. He's the doctor. Now, psychiatry and psychology often work very closely together. Uh, psychology is a, is a discipline which looks at human feelings, thoughts, behavior. Um, so it approaches uh, mental health in a different way. Now, only one branch of psychology deals with mental uh, illness, that is clinical psychology. I mean, you would have a whole lot of psychologists who deal with completely different issues, but a clinical psychologist is trained to understand or to help a person to understand her feelings, her thoughts, her behavior, to reflect on them, to ask this question, how does this relate to my immediate family, my friends, my community? What can I do to address uh, the issues that are bothering me? So it's a completely different approach. Um, what did you ask? Sorry, what did like, you ask? How do you decide? Do I need a psychiatrist or do I need a psychologist? <laughs> or is does the doctors um, decide for me? I mean, I guess some people go straight to a psychiatrist. Some people go straight to a psychologist. 
Sometimes you go to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, listen, I think it would be good if you actually consult a psychologist. So, uh, yeah, all sorts of combinations are possible. Yeah, but the big, big, big uh, combination right now still is the taboo. I mean, even in COVID times, one of the things that we're struggling with is especially the taboo surrounding mental health. Because nobody wants to say, I mean, it's okay to say I have a headache, I have a broken leg, uh, my heart, I'm a diabetes patient, but nobody still wants to talk about the fact that maybe I'm suffering with mental health issues. I know there's a lot of education, but what do you feel and what should be done and how, because this I feel is also such a big challenge that we are coming against. It is, it's a, it's a huge challenge. And, uh, and I think we're actually doing a lot, at least in urban areas, in metropolitan areas. I find that the younger generation is far more open to say, well, I am bipolar or I'm suffering from anxiety. Uh, this would not have happened maybe 10 years ago, but the taboo is there. Uh, and I guess the first thing to do is to talk about it uh, openly and freely and to talk about it with some sensitivity and some knowledge. Uh, I find a lot of people without sensitivity and without knowledge can actually make things much worse. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, one can't go on talking endlessly about a subject uh, in the abstract. It's like if a company is launching a new product, you don't advertise it until the product is available, right? So if you don't have treatment facilities, all this talk, all this awareness, all this sensitivity, it doesn't really get you very far. So I think the two things have to go together. You have to have more conversations, uh, more open talking about these problems and how to handle them, but you also have to have ways to, to find treatment, to get better. No, and the treatment, I mean, I know you talk about it in medieval times, I, you know, it was seen as insanity, a mysterious malady brought upon by evil forces. But I would say that a lot of that is still prevalent today. We st still see a lot of barbaric, I would say, practices, this jar fook. And, I mean, I've still seen it. I've seen it even close to me where people believe that that is the solution if they are suffering and that they have been possessed or something has taken over them. It's absolutely right. Uh, all these very barbaric practices continue to exist today. Uh, in fact, if you go on YouTube, you know, you'll be surprised at the amount of coverage it gets. And people do believe. Uh, and I think it, uh, what I have found is that it's, it's not uh, just poor, uneducated people who believe these things. It's also rich, educated people who buy this, um, this kind of thinking. So I don't know, what do, what do we do about it? The only way out is, uh, as you say, you know, talk more, show more, uh, show the positive side. Uh, yeah. But the, I, sorry. No, I said it's quite, it's quite scary because convincing them, you know, it's because it's such a settled in belief. Absolutely. I mean, these kind of things one can sort of justify in the olden days, when alternatives are not available, when options are not available. But today the options are there, you know? Uh, so they have no place in today's uh, society. One thing that was very interesting, and of course <coughs> I also found, because you do have a small paragraph on it, lunar positions and mental illnesses. What is the connection and is there one? Because people believe everything is associated with the, the sun and the moon and the stars. Well, I don't think there is any connection. <laughs> I know that uh, a lot of people used to believe that, you know, the phases of the moon and how it turns on its axis and how it affects our mental state. Frankly, I think it's all nonsense. <laughs> no, but it was interesting that some psychiatrists actually also, or at least there were some major doctors that- An MP, an yeah, MP I'm, said this. Oh, uh, MP yeah. said this, yeah. <laughs> but after writing this book, I mean, I know you probably have come to some conclusions. What were the major ones? Well, 
if the writing the book helped me to understand the, this journey from uh, say the year 1900 to where we are today, you know? Um, and I think that journey uh, tells us a lot about what we need to do uh, and how much more we need to do. Um, the book does not tell us what we should do. I think that I, I did not feel uh, equipped or qualified to come up with solutions. I think the, the people who are uh, working in this field, professionals, uh, people who are affected by mental illness, people whose families are affected by mental illness, this is something that they need to uh, come up uh, with solutions. It is not my place to give an answer, you know, sitting in my house. <clears throat> writing a book. But uh, from the people I have met and spoken to, from the material I have read, there are a lot of very uh, interesting um, ideas on what to do ahead. Many of them are being uh, sort of put into practice by non-government organizations there are health programs in rural areas, in mental, uh, in urban areas, in which uh, treatment is just one part of the program. Uh, uh, building the awareness, building the sensitivity, that is a huge part. And also, you know, in many, many cases, uh, treatment alone is not enough. A person needs uh, a lot of other support. It might be moral support. It might be physical support. Uh, somebody might need help finding a job. Somebody might need help finding a place to stay. Uh, so uh, since mental illness is not like, say, diabetes, like if I'm diabetic, it basically affects me personally. I have to deal with it, you know. But if I am mentally ill, it affects me, it affects my family, it affects my friends. And in turn, uh, I am affected by what's happening around me. So the solution is not, you know, in this medicine or that medicine or this therapy or that therapy. We need a much more well-rounded uh, way of uh, helping people to live a, a meaningful, fulfilling life. Well said, well said. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed reading your book. And even for a lay person, it was very understandable. So thank you for that because it gave me a lot of knowledge. Any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Um, <laughs> hard to say. I guess the last thought is that I hope this book is meant for the lay reader. You know, that was my entire uh, focus. I want ordinary people like me to read it and to think about it and uh, to find ways to use this uh, reading experience in their own lives in whatever way they can. That, that is really my last thought. Well, thank you. Thank you, Daman, for being with us. That was extremely, extremely informative. And I hope this will bring a little bit of change also in the mindsets of people. Thank you so much, Supriti. It was really nice talking to you. Thank you.